If I was to summarize my time spent with this, the M1 powered brand new MacBook Pro, it would be impressive. No, actually it wouldn't. It would be seriously impressive. What's up YouTube? Welcome back to another video review here on MQuan Reviews with me, MQuan. This is the channel where I talk about my passions, including technology and lifestyle. And if you're new around here, I'd love for you to join me here on the journey. Do smash that subscribe button and hit like if you enjoy this video at any point throughout. Now, behind me is the brand new M1 powered 2020 MacBook Pro. In this video, what I wanna do is share with you my experiences as a creative, somebody that uses a MacBook, not only for content creation here on YouTube, but also on social media. This has been an incredibly interesting experience. And unlike other reviews of the MacBook Pro that focus very heavily on the benchmarks, I'm gonna do a bit of that, but I wanna also focus on a typical creative's workflow as well using this machine. So before we start talking about the specifics, let's just roll back and talk about the major change. Prior to this M1 series Mac, the Mac computers were powered by Intel processors and chips. This is the first system on a chip that Apple have designed specifically for the Mac. And essentially there are a couple of standout features to this. To begin with, it's based on a unified memory architecture or UMA for short. And that basically means that the M1 utilizes a single pool of high performance memory that can be accessed by the entire SOC. As well as that, we've got an eight core CPU with four uh, high performance cores and then we get four high efficiency cores and then up to eight core GPU and this is integrated graphics in the Mac computers. So in this video I'm going to focus on three things that were for me standout experiences with the 13 inch MacBook Pro. So the first one is when it comes to battery life. The second is when it comes to performance and finally the third point is around compatibility. So the first point, battery life. It is absolutely insane because the battery life on this and this point alone, like even if you were to minus out the performance upgrades with the M1 chip, the MacBook Pros, is worth considering upgrading to this new MacBook because the battery life on a MacBook, standard MacBook, Intel powered MacBook would last, you know, half a day, particularly on a 13 inch. That's gone all the way through now to multiple days in my experience. And I charged this up to 100% when I first got this a couple of days ago, and I just ran it. I mean, I used it with Final Cut Pro, 4K editing, rendering, uh, photo editing with Affinity, multiple Safari tabs, Notion, all that kind of stuff. And it went on and on and on until I ended up with almost three full days of that workflow use before I kind of felt like I needed to plug it in. And it was around about 15%. That is incredible. So the battery life improvement, again, down to the M1 chip and the way that the M1 chip has been designed to give you great performance without having a major drain on the power resources. If you compare the M1 chip with some of the other chips that are out there, down it operates at about 10 watts and the more you pile on, it will go up to about 20 watts. So this is the reason why you're getting such good battery life. One of the other things that I noticed was in idle, it consumes very, very little battery life. It will go on for much, much longer. And then something that reminds me of the iPhone, the iPad, the almost instant on feature, as soon as you lift up that lid, it's ready to go. I mean, the battery performance on this is really a major update. The second thing that I wanna talk about is when it comes to performance. Now, there are a ton of different videos out there that have looked at Geekbench scores and a whole range of other score tallies to give you an idea of just how well the M1 chips are performing. But in a summary, let me just put it like this. This is operating at 10 watts and there are other beefier chips that are operating at, let's say 45 or 50 watts. Take the hate series of chips that you find in gaming laptops, for example. This thing will beat them all out in single core clock speeds, which is just mind boggling. Yes, it's a different story when it comes to multi-core clock speeds, but it's still impressive that this thing that's operating at 10 watts when you compare it with another chip that's operating at 50 watts still does a better job without all the noise, without the thermals, and with considerably improved battery performance. It's just incredible. I mean, this is something that when I compare it with the older Intel MacBook Pro that I've been using, the i7 version of that, it just beats the pants off that completely. And 
when it comes to workflow as well, this is the thing, you can really push this. And again, going back to my normal workflow, I'm talking about Final Cut Pro, editing, rendering 4K video, talking about you know photo editing with Affinity apps, and also with multiple you know Safari windows open, occasionally Chrome windows open. It does a very, very good job at keeping up with that. It's almost instant when you're scrolling, scrubbing through footage, in the editing software. Now, a couple of things related to performance. Number one, most of the apps that I generally tend to use are Apple related apps or, you know, Mac friendly apps. So I'm talking Final Cut Pro, Affinity, a few others. And the differences in performance with this than the older MacBook Pro really is noticeable. It doesn't become as noticeable when you start using other suites of applications. So at the moment, at the time of recording this, I was uh, testing out Photoshop and Lightroom, a few others. Those applications aren't ready yet for the M1 MacBooks. So when I compared the uh, software on this to the older MacBook Pro running the Intel i7, the differences were there, but they weren't as noticeable as some of those other apps like Final Cut, for example. And the other thing is that as time goes on, I'll talk about this later on when it comes to compatibility, this is something that we will start to notice as more developers get their apps ready for the M1 chips, you will notice a bigger bump up in performance. Now related to performance also is the thermals. This thing really during my time using it only heated up on occasions when I was rendering 4K video. Again, not heating up in the same way as my older MacBook, but it would start getting warmer. The fans, I didn't hear at all throughout my time, except when I started the test. Shh, can you hear the fans? I can hear them now. Can you hear them now? This is so weird. This is the first time in over a week's use of the MacBook Pro have I noticed the fans, I, I mean, I can hear them. It sounds really, really weird. And I suspect it having something to do with the Cinebench test that I'm running. This is the second, no, in fact, the third Cinebench test that I'm running back to back. But I've also got a ton of other things going on. I've got the Final Cut Pro with 4K video. I've got Photoshop. I've got Chrome with multiple 4K video tabs open. I've got Safari as well and I had a game playing as well, Fruit Ninja, which I've just turned off. But if I go to memory clean really quickly, yeah, as I suspected, it's Cinebench, which is certainly at 2.9, almost three gigabytes, um, really sort of hogging the memory. Then we've got Google Chrome, which I'm not surprised to see, Photoshop, and then Final Cut. But this is really, really weird to hear. So this brings me on to the final point, which is around about compatibility. And right now you might be tempted to run out and pick up this MacBook Pro, but there are a couple of things to consider before you do that. Number one is this current M1 powered MacBook Pro isn't ready for Windows. And there are some people that still boot up Windows on their Mac machine. For this, you need to hold out because currently at the moment of recording this, there isn't a solution to that. It seems like Microsoft need to do something to get this ready for the M1 chips. Uh, but if that is something that you fall into, hold off wait because you're just not going to be able to do that. The second thing is there are a bunch of different apps that are available uh, that aren't yet ready for the M1 chips. Some of those will have problems working, others will work through Rosetta 2. Um, and this is something that I tested out on the Adobe software. Again, Photoshop, Lightroom, a few others. They're not strictly speaking ready to be used on the M1 Max, but Apple have Rosetta 2, which is basically like a emulation, if you like, that will allow some of these apps to run. The other range of apps, and this is where it's still a bit buggy, not as clean as you would like, not that fluid Mac style experience is related to iPhone and iPad apps. Those apps will now run on the M1 powered Max. Uh, but some of those apps just don't feel like they're ready for the M1 Mac. So, you know, when you're turning them into full screen, you don't get that experience. There are a couple of other bugs here and there. They don't feel as yet ready for that. And quite a few developers have opted out of the option to have their iPhone or iPad apps available for Mac. So again, give it a bit of time for that to happen. But if you're going to be sticking to, you know, the normal suite of Mac applications, you know, for video editing, 
for photo editing as well with some of those other apps that are Mac friendly apps, you should have no problems with compatibility whatsoever. And that there is a wrap. I've thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed using the M1 powered MacBook Pro. Um, would I recommend this product? I certainly would. I think even though it's kind of a new generation product, the majority of what Apple have got right with this has been incredible. This is really going to fundamentally change in the way that we've kind of come to love and expect our iPhones and iPads to work. Uh, it's gonna do the same with the laptop experience. Um, yes, if you are somebody that uses Windows and there are certain applications that aren't yet Mac ready that you're dependent on, I would probably say hold out. But for majority of people that don't have those restrictions, this is certainly worth considering. The next question you have to ask yourself is that should you go for the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro? The MacBook Pro certainly has an advantage because it has the fan. Um, that means that the M1 chip can operate at its maximum capacity. It also has the eight cores, whereas there's one less on the MacBook Air. But guys, I mean, from a price perspective, Apple really haven't changed the prices on either the MacBook Air M1 or the MacBook Pro M1. So you're still getting a very, very good price, but with that additional chip and all the performance upgrades to that and the battery life as well, absolutely incredible. Let me know your thoughts. What do you think about this year's MacBook Pros with the M1 powered chips? Are you planning on picking any of these up? Plus, if you're new around here, be sure to smash that subscribe button, hit like if you enjoy this video, and do check out some of the other videos that I've got here on my channel. Till next time, stay safe. I'm M. Kwan. Peace and blessings.